Today is Wednesday, February 1st, 2023. We're here tonight at the Four Lakes Church of Christ in Madison, Wisconsin to study the book of Genesis. We are in Genesis chapter 35 tonight, and we may also be able to cover Genesis 36. So we're actually looking at two chapters, so I'd invite you to be taking a Bible and turning with me to Genesis chapters 35 and 36. And we're very glad that you've joined us tonight. We also want to invite you to be with us in person for Bible class at 9.30 this coming Sunday morning and for worship at 10.30. We're looking at the book of Ephesians in the Bible class and we're getting back to our study of the book of Hebrews in the Sunday morning worship assembly at 10.30. If you have any questions about what you see or hear in class tonight, any concerns, anything that we need to be praying about, we want to invite you to call or send a message to 608-224-0274. We'd love to hear from you. And if you've not yet subscribed to the YouTube channel, we also want to invite you to do that. But tonight we are back to the book of Genesis, the book of beginnings, written by Moses, and we're continuing in our study of Jacob. So our big characters in this book so far, of course, we've looked at Adam and Eve and Noah and then Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Jacob is back in the promised land. He did not get murdered by his brother Esau, so that's the good news over the past few weeks. And then last week we looked at the attack on Dinah and how her brothers retaliated for that by murdering everybody in the village of Shechem. And tonight we finally get to the birth of Benjamin. So this is a highlight in the book of Genesis, at least in this part of it. By way of just very brief review, bringing us up to speed on the chart again, we have the first four sons born to Leah. Rachel can't have children, so the next two are born to her maid Bilhah. Then we have two more born to Leah's maid Zilpah. We have three more born to Leah. Then Joseph is born to Rachel, her firstborn. And that is uh, tonight is when we get to Benjamin. So I've kind of uh, put him back on the, on the chart here in all black letters. So uh, Benjamin is uh, about to be born here. Uh, before we get to Benjamin, let's pick up with the first paragraph tonight. This is Genesis chapter 35, verses 1 through 4. Genesis chapter 35, verses 1 through 4. Then God said to Jacob, Arise, go up to Bethel, and live there, and make an altar there to God, who appeared to you when you fled from your brother Esau. So Jacob said to his household and to all who were with him, Put away the foreign gods which are among you, and purify yourselves, and change your garments, and let us arise and go up to Bethel, and I will make an altar there to God, who answered me in the day of my distress." and has been with me wherever I have gone. So they gave to Jacob all the foreign gods which they had, and the rings which were in their ears. And Jacob hid them under the oak which was near Shechem. Let's remember we closed out the previous chapter with Jacob's sons murdering all of the men of Shechem, looting all the stuff, taking their wives and their children. And Jacob was concerned that his sons had made him odious to the rest of the locals. In other words, he was worried about retaliation. So around that same time then, God therefore appears to Jacob, tells him to take this trip up to Bethel to build him an altar. Uh, Bethel, of course, was the place where Jacob had the vision of the angels going up and down the ladder or the stairway to heaven a number of years earlier. In fact, back in Genesis 28, verses 20 and 21, on his first pass through Bethel, the text says that Jacob made a vow saying, If God will be with me, and will keep me on this journey that I take, and will give me food to eat and garments to wear, and I return to my father's house in safety, then the Lord will be my God. This stone which I have set up as a pillar will be God's house, and of all that you give me, I will surely give a tenth to you. So that was back a number of chapters previous to this, and so now, many years later, Jacob is back, and he's now ready to fulfill this vow that he made to the Lord many years earlier. Uh, God has certainly taken care of him in a powerful way, and so now he agrees that God will, in fact, be his God. So now he's ready to leave Shechem and to go back up there to prepare for this trip. Jacob has this family meeting, and he tells all of his people to clean out all of the idols. And this is interesting. Uh, even as a God-fearing man, Jacob and his people, at least those in his family, they seem to be worshiping foreign gods. This is a concern. And if you remember, even Rachel, his favorite wife, had uh, taken her father's family idol. And when, of course, he found out about it and chased them down, Rachel had uh, hidden the idols in the saddle. And so this is very personal. But I, I at least think we can say something good about Jacob here, that he takes on the role of a leader in his family, a spiritual leader. And so he's making this statement to his family. This is what we will do. We will put away the foreign gods. We're heading up to Bethel. 
And when we get there, we will build an altar just as God has commanded. And the reason is, uh, God has been very good to our family. And so they take all this stuff and they hide everything under an oak tree in this area. So let's continue then with Genesis 35 verses 5 through 8. Genesis 35 verses 5 through 8. As they journeyed, there was a great terror upon the cities which were around them, and they did not pursue the sons of Jacob. So Jacob came to Luz, that is Bethel, which is in the land of Canaan, he and all the people who were with him. He built an altar there and called the place El Bethel, because there God had revealed himself to him when he fled from his brother. Now Deborah, Rebekah's nurse, died, and she was buried below Bethel under the oak. It was named Alon Bakuth. Let's remember that Jacob is at least a, a bit concerned about the locals retaliating for their slaughter of Shechem. However, I would just want us to note here that God has this covered. They're worried about it, but really they don't need to be because God knows about this. It seems that God has intentionally terrified all the surrounding cities, preventing them from attacking Jacob and his people as they leave the area. And they arrive safely up in Bethel. They build this altar. They rename the place El Bethel, meaning God of Bethel. And this is where we have a little footnote that uh, Deborah, Rebecca's nurse, dies. And they bury her near Bethel under this oak tree. In fact, they rename the place Anan Bakuth, which means Oak of Weeping. And I don't know whether anybody remembers this, but we noted this actually back in Genesis 24. When Abraham's servant went to get Rebekah as a wife for Isaac, you may remember that the family sent Rebekah's maid along with her. And she was pretty much a part of the family from that point forward. She was loved, she was accepted, and she was certainly uh, mourned at her passing. As I was looking into this a few days ago, I wanted to know when and where Rebekah died. And so I started looking up. Uh, uh, doing scripture searches for Rebecca and her death, and I couldn't really remember that being mentioned. And uh, sure enough, we have no record of Rebecca's death in scripture. And isn't that interesting? We know exactly when and where her nurse died, and where her nurse or her maid or her servant was buried, but we don't know anything about Rebecca's death. And uh, that's interesting to me. We do know uh, from a later passage that she was buried in the cave of Machpelah, along with Abraham and Sarah and Isaac and Leah. Uh, but that's after the fact that we're given that bit of information. We don't have any actual information about when or where she actually died. But anyway, this is the uh, record of her servant's death. And this is where we learned that this uh, servant or her maid, her name was Deborah. So this is the first of two Debras in the Bible, at least as far as I can remember. And I can't think of a, a third or a fourth Deborah, but we do have this Deborah. Uh, Rebecca's servant or maid, and then we also have Deborah the judge later on in the Old Testament many years later. So let's continue tonight with Genesis 35 verses 9 through 15. Genesis 35 verses 9 through 15. Then God appeared to Jacob again when he came from Padan Aram and he blessed him. God said to him, your name is Jacob. You shall no longer be called Jacob, but Israel shall be your name. Thus he called him Israel. God also said to him, I am God Almighty. Be fruitful and multiply. A nation and a company of nations shall come from you, and kings shall come forth from you. The land which I gave to Abraham and Isaac, I will give it to you, and I will give the land to your descendants after you. Then God went up from him in the place where he had spoken with him. Jacob set up a pillar in the place where he had spoken with him, a pillar of stone, and he poured out a drink offering on it. He also poured oil on it. So Jacob named the place where God had spoken with him, Bethel. Well, once he arrives in Bethel, God appears to Jacob yet again, uh, pretty much giving Jacob a reminder. First of all, God reminds him that his name has been changed to Israel. Uh, but secondly, God reminds him of the promise that he first made to his grandfather Abraham and to his father Isaac. And this time we find that uh, he will have kings and nations among his descendants. And I think we need to ask that. Were there kings in this family line? Well, obviously, if we think about that, obviously there were. We think of Saul and David and Solomon and the others. And then we also have the land promise being renewed. This has been given and reminders have been given a number of times over the past several generations here. 
And then in the last few verses, Jacob builds this altar as God has commanded. He renames the place Bethel. And that's interesting. It was already named Bethel, but uh, many years had passed. Uh, and they hadn't been around. They'd been up in uh, the land of Haran. And so I'm thinking that the name really didn't stick the first time when he named it Bethel many years previously. They weren't around to kind of defend that name. And a place is named what people will call it. And uh, so apparently that name had faded through the years. And so he renames it Bethel uh, now that they're back in the area on this occasion. So let's continue then with Genesis 35 verses 16 through 21. Genesis 35, 16 through 21. Then they journeyed from Bethel. And when there was still some distance to go to Ephrath, Rachel began to give birth, and she suffered severe labor. When she was in severe labor, the midwife said to her, Do not fear, for now you have another son. It came about as her soul was departing, for she died, that she named him Ben-Onai. But his father called him Benjamin. So Rachel died and was buried on the way to Ephrath, that is Bethlehem. Jacob set up a pillar over her grave, that is the pillar of Rachel's grave to this day. Then Israel journeyed on and pitched his tent beyond the Tower of Eder. Well, just to summarize, Rachel dies in childbirth as they're traveling somewhere between Bethel and Ephrath. And uh, the son survives. He is uh, described here as another son. So that just kind of points us back to that chart that we've had. If we remember, the first son born to Jacob and Rachel was Joseph. And so this is son number two, Benjamin. And of course, before Rachel dies, she names him Ben-Onai, which means son of my sorrow. But Jacob renames him Benjamin, which means son of my right hand. And I know it's a little bit strange for a mom to name the son and then for dad to overrule mom on that name by giving him another name. Uh, but to me, this really seems to be almost the uh, merciful thing to do. And I think if we look carefully at the text, she named him as her soul was leaving. So I'm thinking this with her last dying breath, she names him son of my sorrow. And again, you know, after she passes away, Jacob looks at this situation and I'm just uh, trying to have us maybe imagine growing up with the name son of my sorrow knowing that your mom had given you that name as she died in childbirth. That'd just be an awful burden for a child to bear growing up. It's a terrible thing to do to a kid. And so Jacob gives Benjamin a name of honor, son of my right hand. Um, one commentary suggested that people in that culture would often stand facing the east, especially for an act of worship or some official occasion. And so if you were facing the east, the sun of your right hand, your right hand would be directed toward the south. And so one commentary was suggesting that he was basically naming his son as a son of the south, uh, meaning that he was born in the south when, of course, everybody else in that family was born up in the north, up near Haran. Um, but in that culture, though, of course, to sit at somebody's right hand would be a place of great honor. And that is certainly part of it. I would kind of lean toward this, maybe as even a better explanation, something with a little more solidity behind it. Uh, but even today, when we refer to somebody as my right-hand man, obviously that's a place of honor. This is somebody that I trust. It's somebody that I love. Uh, but this is what the name Benjamin means, um, son of my right hand. Uh, Rachel is then buried along the way to this place that we now know as Bethlehem, um, Ephrath, um, by the way. You may remember when King Herod kills all the baby boys in this same area many years earlier, or later after this, around the time Jesus is born, uh, Matthew quotes Jeremiah, doesn't he? And says, a voice was heard in Ramah, weeping and great mourning, Rachel weeping for her children, and she refused to be comforted because they were, not because they were no more. So Rachel then is associated with weeping. That goes back to this account, I believe. And she is buried right there uh, just outside of Bethlehem, where other mothers would also weep for their sons many years later. So we have some history here, and that's the value of studying this. Kind of makes the New Testament uh, make more sense. So let's continue tonight with Genesis 35, verses 22 through 29. Genesis 35, 22 through 29. It came about while Israel was dwelling in that land that Reuben went and lay with Bilhah, his father's concubine, and Israel heard of it. 
Now there were twelve sons of Jacob, the sons of Leah, Reuben, Jacob's firstborn, then Simeon, and Levi, and Judah, and Issachar, and Zebulun, the sons of Rachel, Joseph, and Benjamin, and the sons of Bilhah, Rachel's maid, Dan, and Naphtali, and the sons of Zilpah, Leah's maid, Gad, and Asher. These are the sons of Jacob who were born to him in Padan Aram. Jacob came to his father Isaac at Mamre of Kiriath Arba, that is Hebron, where Abraham and Isaac had sojourned. Now the days of Isaac were 180 years. Isaac breathed his last and died and was gathered to his people, an old man of ripe age, and his sons Esau and Jacob buried him. Wow, we have this weird and really terrible thing happen up in verse 22. Reuben has relations with his father's concubine, Bilhah, basically his, basically his stepmother would be one way of looking at that. And although we're specifically told Jacob knows about this, uh, what I find interesting is we're not told whether he does anything about it. And so I would assume there were no consequences for this. And that seems to be in keeping with a pattern here. He seems to ignore this thing. And that seems to be what he did with the rape of Dinah, his daughter. Uh, he seems somewhat slow to take action on these events. Um, so Jacob may not do anything right at this moment. He does not forget either, though. So uh, you may remember on his deathbed and what we might describe as an ethical will, uh, Jacob will start with Reuben. Um, around his deathbed, giving those blessings, or really, in this case, curses to some of his children. This is what he will say. Reuben, you are my firstborn, my might and the beginning of my strength, preeminent in dignity and preeminent in power, uncontrolled as water. You shall not have preeminence because you went up to your father's bed. Then you defiled it. He went up to my couch. All right. A week or two ago, we saw a similar condemnation of Simeon and Levi, didn't we? In the ethical will, the blessing on his deathbed. That was after the slaughter of Shechem. And so he condemns those two sons for that. And now we have this condemnation of Reuben. Uh, and, and in fact, we have more information, don't we? That this happened on Jacob's bed. And so here he is, even as an older man, he has not forgotten that disrespect. And that comes up at the end of his life there. And then in the rest of Genesis 49, he'll continue outlining those sons and various blessings and, and curses on them. Uh, as we've been keeping track of the sons in the chart. In verse 27, Jacob finally makes it to his father Isaac down in Hebron. Basically, uh, Jacob has been slowly making his way south. He finally arrives, uh, apparently just in time for his father Isaac to pass away at the age of 180. And he is then buried by his sons Jacob and Esau. Uh, remember, Isaac and Ishmael came together to bury their father Abraham many years earlier. And now we have Jacob left here as the patriarch of the family after his father Isaac dies. Um, what concerns might Jacob have at this point now that his father has died? You know, I'm thinking that he might be at least a little bit concerned about who may be capable of carrying on when he dies. Remember, Reuben, the firstborn, pretty much has committed incest with his own stepmother. It's just weird. And the second and third born that we might expect to take over in Reuben's absence, uh, Simeon and Levi, they've proven they're pretty quick to anger. They'll do some terrible things. Uh, they'll murder entire villages. So they're not really ready to take over. And so now we're, we're moving on down the line, aren't we? And in my mind, I'm thinking Jacob may be getting a little bit nervous. It's not looking good. And uh, Jacob really has not done a good job bringing up his sons to fear the Lord at this point. So we'll, we'll dig into that over the next several chapters. You know, normally we've been covering one chapter a night. Sometimes we go 25 minutes, 30 minutes. Sometimes we go over 45 minutes in these classes. Uh, but we've been covering one chapter every night in these classes. Time has not been a factor. It's been, we've been teaching the text, not to the time. Uh, back when we were meeting in person, if you remember way back in the olden days, I would teach until eight o'clock, no matter what. That's when the bell rang. That's when the kids came up the stairs. So we would just stop where we were. Uh, but in this format, uh, over the past few years, um, we study to the text. We study to the chapter, not to the time. But tonight, I want us to uh, deviate from that little, uh, just a little bit. And let's just press forward very briefly and quickly push through Genesis 36, mainly because it's pretty much just a huge list of names. It's the, the genealogy of the descendants of Esau. So not Jacob, but Esau. And I really don't want to dedicate an entire class to a list of names, especially since I'm heading out of town uh, after worship this Sunday. 
So if we look at this tonight, we'll start fresh when I get back by jumping into the study of Joseph in chapter 37. So that'll be a good breaking point. So before we end tonight, let's do a, a fairly brief um, overview, really, of Genesis 36. So let's start with Genesis 36, 1 through 8. Genesis 36, verses 1 through 8. Now, these are the records of the generations of Esau, that is, Edom. Esau took his wives from the daughters of Canaan, Adah, the daughter of Elon the Hittite, and Aholibama, the daughter of Anah, and the granddaughter of Zibion the Hivite, also Basemath, Ishmael's daughter, the sister of Nebaioth. Adah bore Eliphaz to Esau, and Basemath bore Ruel. And Aholibama bore Jeush and Jalam and Korah, these are the sons of Esau who were born to him in the land of Canaan. Then Esau took his wives and his sons and his daughters and all his household and his livestock and all his cattle and all his goods which he had acquired in the land of Canaan and went to another land away from his brother Jacob. For their property had become too great for them to live together and the land where they sojourned could not sustain them because of their livestock. So Esau lived in the hill country of Seir. Esau is Edom." Well, just a quick note from the first few verses, Esau gets his wives from among the locals, from among the Canaanites. Uh, Jacob at least listened to his parents and uh, went and got his wives from among their people up north who were more in line with their way of thinking spiritually, worshiping God. But uh, Esau goes full-blown idol worshiper for his wives. And the other quick note here is that Esau then heads out. Uh, just as Abraham and Lot had to separate, just as Jacob and Laban had to separate, so also Jacob and Esau get too crowded. And it seems that Esau is the one who volunteers to leave. Remember, uh, Jacob needs to be in the promised land. This is promised to him, not to Esau. Uh, but Esau, he can take it or leave it, so he leaves it. And Esau heads south to the hill country of Seir. This is the place known as Edom. And in fact, we have a whole book of the Bible uh, about the Edomites, the book of Obadiah, which is one of five one-chapter books in the Bible. So if you're looking for a quick book to read, the book of Obadiah is one chapter. And that book was written to condemn the Edomites, the descendants of Esau, who pretty much rejoiced when they saw the Israelites being attacked and taken into captivity. And so God has a message to the prophet Obadiah, to these people down there saying, basically, you're next and uh, you, you shouldn't be rejoicing in the trouble of others, especially when they're my people. That's just my summary of the book of Obadiah. Um, so the land of Edom is down south of the Dead Sea. Later, their capital city would be the place we know today as Petra. Uh, the buildings carved out of the walls of the canyon. I think that was featured in the uh, Indiana Jones. I think it was the Temple of Doom, if I remember correctly. And that was filmed in Petra. That was the headquarters of the Edomite people for many, many years. Um, by the way, this chapter is pretty much the last time we hear from Esau in Scripture. We've got a few references back to the past uh, elsewhere in the Bible. But uh, this is it in terms of Esau being an active player in Scripture. We've got this chapter with some genealogy. And then after this, he disappears. So let's continue just briefly with uh, Genesis 36, verses 9 through 19. Genesis 36, 9 through 19. These then are the records of the generations of Esau, the father of the Edomites in the hill country of Seir. These are the names of Esau's sons. Eliphaz, the son of Esau's wife, Adah. Ruel, the son of Esau's wife, Basemath. The sons of Eliphaz were Teman, Omar, Zepho, and Gatam, and Kenaz. Timnah was a concubine of Esau's son Eliphaz, and she bore Amalek to Eliphaz. These are the sons of Esau's wife Ada. These are the sons of Ruel, Nahath and Zerah, Shammah and Mizah. These were the sons of Esau's wife Basemath. These were the sons of Esau's wife Oholibama, the daughter of Anah and the granddaughter of Zibian. She bore to Esau, Jeush and Jalam and Korah. These are the chiefs of the sons of Esau. The sons of Eliphaz, the firstborn of Esau, are Chief Teman, Chief Omar, Chief Zepho, Chief Kenaz, Chief Korah, Chief Gatam, Chief Amalek. These are the chiefs descended from Eliphaz in the land of Edom. These are the sons of Adah. These are the sons of Ruel, Esau's sons. Uh, chief Nahath, Chief Zerah, Chief Shammah, Chief Mizah. These are the chiefs descended from Ruel in the land of Edom. These are the sons of Esau's wife, Basemath. These are the sons of Esau's wife, Aholibama, Chief Jeush, Chief Jalam, Chief Korah. These are the chiefs descended from Esau's wife, Aholibama, the daughter of Anah. These are the sons of Esau, that is Edom, and these are their chiefs. Um, <laughs> I'll have to admit it. 
Uh, these guys have some uh, kind of interesting, cool names. Um, but to us, these names aren't too significant, are they? I, I read through these, and I'm like, ah, I don't really know if, if we need to know this. Uh, that's a question that I'm, I'm kind of wondering. And so they aren't significant to us. You know, we're more interested in the descendants of Jacob. And that's the rest of the Bible, really. And so we might ask, then, then why do we have this? Why are these names even recorded? Well, I think we need to remember who writes this and when he's writing. This was written by Moses, and he's writing as he leads the Israelites through the wilderness. And so I'm thinking these people probably appreciated knowing something about their distant cousins, especially as they are traveling through their land. I hope that makes sense. In other words, it's almost like Moses is saying, uh, you see those people over there? You know, those are Esau's great-great-grandchildren. And I think that's why we have so many names here, especially the names of the chiefs or the rulers of these people. Uh, one of the commentaries suggested that the word chief may refer to a ruler of a thousand. And so it's not really a reference to a king. It's not really nation status, um, but maybe a leader of what we might describe today as a clan or as a gang. Uh, these are uh, perhaps warlords of some kind, a term we might use today. Uh, leaders of big groups of people, but not quite what we would describe as various nations. And Moses is leading the people through some of these areas, and so he's saying, this is where these people came from. This is how we're related. Uh, by the way, in verse 12, we have a reference to one of Esau's grandsons, I believe, if I got that right. A guy by the name of Amalek, he would become the father of the Amalekites, and they would eventually become a pretty serious enemy of God's people. They would constantly attack the Israelites, and these are the people God told Saul to destroy completely. And Saul, of course, refused to kill all of them. So he said he obeyed God, but he didn't because he didn't obey completely. And that, of course, is what led to Saul's downfall as king. But I'm just saying that starts right here with this uh, reference to Amalek, the uh, father of that nation or that group of people. So let's continue with Genesis 36, verses 20 through 30. Genesis 36, 20 through 30. These are the sons of Seir the Horite. The inhabitants of the land, Lotan and Shobal and Zibion and Anna and Dishon and Ezer and Dishan. These are the chiefs descended from the Horites, the sons of Seir in the land of Edom. The sons of Lotan were Horai and Hemam, and Lotan's sister was Timnah. These are the sons of Shobal, Alvan and Manath and Ebal, Shepho and Onam. These are the sons of Zibion, Ea and Anna. He is the Anna who found the hot springs in the wilderness when he was pasturing the donkeys of his father Zibion. Uh, these are the children of Anna, Dishon and Aholibamah, the daughter of Anna. These are the sons of Dishon, Hemdan and Eshban and Ithran and Cheran. These are the sons of Ezer, Bilhan and Zavan and Akan. These are the sons of Dishan, Uz and Aran. These are the, these are the chiefs descended from the Horites, Chief Lotan, Chief Shobal, Chief Zibion, Chief Anna, Chief Dishan, Chief Ezer, Chief Dishan. These are the chiefs descended from the Horites according to their various chiefs in the land of Seir. A lot of repetition there for some reason. I think we can probably say the same thing here. As we noted in that last paragraph, these names may not mean much to us, uh, but I think we have to assume that these names were probably pretty important to the Israelites as they traveled through the wilderness. They were passing through some of these people. Uh, one thing that caught my eye was the reference in verse 20 to the sons of a guy uh, known as a Horite, H-O-R-I-T-E. And that word apparently refers to somebody who is a cave dweller, a Horite, a cave dweller. We have already had at least one caveman in the Bible, haven't we? I'm thinking of Lot. Lot is described as living in a cave. And now we have an entire group of people who are known for living in caves. I know today a lot of times archaeologists will say, ooh, you know, somebody was living in a cave. They must have grunted and, uh, you know, not have spoken any language and, uh, you know, prehistoric man kind of thing. Not necessarily, not at all. Uh, we have cavemen in the Bible, Lot and now the Horites. And we have people living in caves uh, even yet today, we have some interesting caves here in uh, here in Wisconsin. Uh, 
the house on the rock is almost that kind of situation but uh, people have this fascination with living in caves today but that goes back to necessity and of course down in that area there would have been a lot of caves in which to live uh, something else catches my eye comes in verse 24 with the reference to anna who found the hot springs in the wilderness when he was pasturing the donkeys of his father uh, some of you know that I have spent some uh, serious time hiking to various hot springs out in Montana and Idaho and uh, elsewhere in the Pacific Northwest. And on some of those hikes, sometimes I wonder, who found this place? How did that happen? How did somebody find this hot spring absolutely, completely, literally in the middle of nowhere and here's this hot spring where you can get in and relax and enjoy this warm water. Well, in this passage, Moses explains who found the hot springs. And so I'm thinking Moses is basically saying to his people, you see those hot springs over there? Uh, those were discovered by Anna when he was wandering around with his donkeys. He, he is your long lost cousin. And uh, that's the explanation for this, uh, this uh, uh, geothermal feature here. Um, well, let's uh, continue with uh, Genesis 36, 31 through 43. Genesis 36, 31 through 43. Now, these are the kings who reigned in the land of Edom before any king reigned over the sons of Israel. Bela, the son of Beor, reigned in Edom, and the name of his city was Denhaba. Then Bela died, and Jobab, the son of Zerah of Bozrah, became king in his place. Then Jobab died, and Husham of the land of the Temanites became king in his place. Then Husham died. And Hadad, the son of Bedad, who defeated Midian in the field of Moab, became king in his place, and the name of his city was Abith. Then Hadad died, and Samlah of Masrachah became king in his place. Then Samlah died, and Shaul of Rehoboth on the Euphrates River became king in his place. Then Shaul died, and Baal Hanan, the son of Akbor, became king in his place. Then Baal Hanan, the son of Akbor, died, and Hadar became king in his place, and the name of his city was Pau. And his wife's name was Mihatabal, the daughter of Matred, daughter of Mizahab. Now, these are the names of the chiefs descended from Esau, according to their families and their localities by their names. Chief Timnah, Chief Alva, Chief Jatheth, Chief Oholibama, Chief Elah, Chief Pinan, Chief Kenaz, Chief Timon, Chief Mizbar, Mibzar, Chief Magdiel, Chief Iram. These are the chiefs of Edom, that is Esau, the father of the Edomites, according to their habitations in the land of their possession. Once again, a whole lot of names that are not too relevant to us, but uh, again, they would have been relevant to the people who read this for the first time as they move through this area into the promised land. And uh, we do have several uh, place names is here. I think that's another part of this. They are not imaginary places. But many of these are places that we can still find on a map even to this day. And if we can't find these on a map, I'm suggesting someday we may be able to. Certainly nothing uh, contradicts known history at this point. So tonight we've covered Genesis 35 and 36. We've seen Jacob move deep into the promised land. We've seen the death of Rachel. We've seen the birth of Benjamin. We've seen Jacob reunited with his father Isaac. We've seen the death of Isaac. And we've also seen Esau head down south to the land of Edom. So a lot gets explained in this uh, chapter, or the two chapters that we've studied. And with that, thank you for joining us tonight. I'll be heading out of town after worship this coming Lord's Day. So we'll have a couple guest speakers for the next two Wednesdays. We might not be able to share these on YouTube due to copyright stuff and the way YouTube is structured. Uh, so if you depend on YouTube to get our classes, let me know. Send me a text, 608-224-0274, email fourlakeschurch at gmail.com, and uh, I'll send you a link to the two classes that we'll be uh, linking to for the next two Wednesdays, and uh, that'll probably be some Bible geography, and i got something else in mind as well. And I can add you either to the Facebook live stream group where we'll post those, or I can send you an email. We've got an email list for those who want to be notified of the live streams. And, uh, but hopefully we can come back together in three weeks to start looking at the life of Joseph in Genesis 37. So hope to see most of you in person this coming Lord's Day morning at 930, then after class, uh, 1030 for our worship assembly. But let's close tonight by going to God in prayer. Our Father in heaven, you are a God who sees us in our time of distress, and you have rescued us. You've saved us from sin. You've saved us from your wrath. And you've saved us in many, time, in many situations, even from ourselves. And so tonight we ask for your blessing as we put away the false gods that we have perhaps worshipped in the past. 
destructive behaviors, dangerous ways of thinking, evil thoughts, anything that would separate us from you. Father, we ask that you would help us conquer the desire to do wrong. Tonight, we ask for strong hearts, intent on doing what's right. Help us, Father, to love each other as we should. And Father, tonight, we are so thankful for your kingdom, the church, your body, our Christian family. Thank you, Father, for being with those we love and bringing them through some special challenges over the past week or so. We're thankful tonight for your healing hand. We're thankful tonight for successful surgery, for strength to overcome illness and disease. And we're thankful that you've given us the ability to serve one another through these things. Be with those who are still struggling. We pray for strength. And tonight we pray for comfort and healing. Thank you, Father, for Jesus. We come to you in his name. Amen.